I thank you, Father, for giving us this opportunity to be together. You have blessed us with so much. You've given us an information that has brought us closer to you and to your son. We pray that you give us the ability to glorify you and your son in our lives. Our fellowship is with you, Father, and with your son. We pray that by your spirit, we would be blessed and we would be led. We'd be able to help understand more what it is that you would have us to do in future ministry in your, for your people and with your people. Thank you for this opportunity to share together. I pray that everybody here, everybody listening would be blessed, that we would be encouraged and your life will be lived out again through us. Thank you in Jesus name. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> So soon, it looks like for you, it's Sabato and Gemma. All right? <laughs> yeah, that's one of the things I remember from Swahili. I don't remember very much. But uh, I recognize some of your faces. It's really good to see you. God bless you all. And now, I, real, I realize, having been sent something from dear brother Zedok recently, that Somebody was baptized. Is that somebody there right now in the audience? No? All right, I, I can't hear you, so I, I don't know. I, I'll just wait for you to raise your hand if that's the person. He's if not, then... Not He's not there. He's not there, okay. Well, praise the Lord. I'm glad that people are still um, willing to receive the truth and coming to the light. Uh, it's been a blessing. Well, I have not been there for a while to Kenya, but it looks like the work is still continuing. You know what I love about Kenya and the work going there? There's a lot of young people that are involved, and that is so exciting to me because uh, it's, it's from the young people that the work of the pioneers was started, and it's from the young people that it's going to be ending. Now, I'm, I'm beyond the young people. I'm, I'm already one of the older guys, so you young people got to take this up and move. You got to move quickly. We've got to finish this work as best as we can, honoring God in our lives and uh, glorifying his son as well. So today I've been asked to talk about hovering over the churches. And, you know, this is a really dear subject to me because this is actually the message that caused me to go and do something other than the ministry in the Seventh-day Adventist Church in North America. Uh, as a pastor, that is. And so I am honored to be able to speak a little bit about it. I can give you a bit of my testimony first, and then we'll read some of what the Bible says, and also along with the writings of Sister White, which, by the way, all of it, the writings of the Bible and the writings of Sister White, are the spirit of prophecy. So um, when somebody says the Bible and the spirit of prophecy, they're actually saying the Bible and the Bible. Uh, they don't realize that, but just... For clarification on when I speak, I'm going to say the Bible and the writings of Ellen White. If I say the spirit of prophecy, what I'm referring to is all of the writings that we've been given through the prophets, okay? So one thing that I went through as a minister is with some friends of mine, I went to a meeting where there was a man named Dave Westbrook. He was actually holding a series calling people out of the cities. And we went there with great interest. I was living in Grand Rapids, Michigan at the time, which is a fairly large city. And I knew that the message was important for us to get out of the cities, but I didn't really know how because as a pastor, I'd been called into a city and I was just working in my mind with, you know, what do I do right now and how do I do it? So one of the things he shared after communicating with he and uh, his team with me is uh, one of the studies he had been going through in the writings of Sister White, which is called hovering or hover or settled pastors. Okay, so when he started sharing that information with me, I, I hadn't heard about it before. So I went and as I do, I studied it myself. And I looked at the word hover, H-O-V-E-R in the writings of Sister White. And there's so much that she says about it that I was overwhelmed. I thought, man, I started putting uh, studies together. And then I looked at the phrase hovering because not only hover, but hovering, which led me to the phrase settled, settled pastors. And I recognized in the writings of Sister White that I was doing in the ministry that God had called me to something contrary to what God had asked me to do. 
And so I really started looking around in my spiritual mind thinking, what am I, what can I do? What is it that I'm doing? Well, at that time, I was also reading uh, the book called Cole Porter Ministry. If you haven't read that one, it's really, really powerful. And in that book, she talks about how important the book is, the printed page, the publications, <clears throat> the periodicals, the uh, distributing of all those things that God has given through the writings of not only Sister White, but also the pioneers and the various books uh, that, that we have been blessed with. Well, I was going through that, but, you know, 150 years later in this um, atmosphere or in this uh, life of digital activities, because I've always been interested in computers ever since I became a Christian, because I never had one before that, not my own personal computer, but I got a computer from my father as a gift when I became a Christian. And um, as a result, I was always interested in the computer. So I was already making DVDs. I was already making CDs. I was already making MP3s and flash videos and websites and working with graphics and I was uh, adjusting audio and various things, recording songs, and I was already doing a lot of things in the computer. So when I read that book, Cold Porter Ministry, I didn't see it as the printed page, you know, like the, the holy book that God had given us. Um, this is my wife's Bible here, but <clears throat> I didn't read it as though she was only referring to the printed page, whether it be the Great Controversy, the Desire of Ages, even the uh, Thoughts on Daniel and Revelation and the various books she wanted to be distributed. Christ's Object Lessons is another one that was very important to her. I saw it, instead of just those books, I saw it as distribution of MP3s, which are music files, or MP4s, which are now video files, or at the time, flash videos, but they've kind of squashed flash videos and we don't have those much anymore. And so now we have websites and we have DVDs, we have, um, YouTube and Facebook and WhatsApp and we have Telegram and all these various ways we can spread the message. Well, that's what I was seeing as I was reading those words in the Cole Porter ministry. And she was talking about how at the end those words would, uh, I'm sorry, those books would be distributed and that would be the silent messengers that would be sitting on the shelves of people and thousands of people would be converted in a day as a result those things that were in those books and here I'm thinking about websites and I'm thinking about videos and and just my mind was going wow how do I make this happen so while I was studying the hovering concept I was also stuttering studying sorry the concept of um, distributing literature if you get into the uh, the nine volumes of the testimonies I believe it's number six or seven I think it's six the sixth volume that talks about how when she went into, I think Australia, there was a great distribution going on and she realized that the world was opening up. The publishing work had opened up for sure. I don't know if it was at that time that she wrote volume six where she was in Australia, but the publishing work started going around the world. And so I had already read the testimonies. I realized that uh, there was um, amazing truth there. So all these things put together, working as a minister, an, or, uh, an ordained, uh, senior pastor in the Seventh-day Adventist Church for many years already. In fact, at that point, it was seven years. And um, reading the concepts that Sister White talks about hovering or settled pastors, and then also reading at the same time Cole Porter Ministry, I just was really convicted. I said, Lord, I don't have the ability to do what you've called me to do. So I started looking in the Bible. Of course, the book of Acts is a really good place to go when you're, <clears throat> excuse me, when you're trying to find information in regard to um, the concept of a hovering pastor or what we should be doing as pastors, ministers in the work of the Lord here at this time um, compared to the way that it's set up in the general conference system here in North America. Um, so I say here in North America because let me give you another part of my testimony. During that time, I think it was in 2006 or seven, I don't remember. I ended up going to Tanzania. I was in Tanzania, which is some people call it Tanzania over here, but I know when I was over there, they called it Tanzania. So I was over there and I was able to see a pastor 
that he was, in fact, it was Pastor Injema instead of Imjema. So it was an N instead of an M. So it sounded very much like blessing, like, you know, blessed Sabbath from Gemma, but it was in Gemma. And so, I mean, some people may not be able to hear that, but you know, it's an N instead of an M. Anyways, there in, in Tanzania or Tanzania, I was able to see his work in action. Now, I was really impressed with the idea that he had 22 churches. Okay. Um, when I went there, I, he asked me the question, how many churches do you have? And I said, well, I've, I've actually got three. And he goes, because, you know, as a pastor in North America, you have one church or you have two or you have three. Sometimes you have four. But here in North America, if you have four churches, it's like, whoa, you've got four churches. Wow, that's huge. That's so much work. Well, it's not supposed to be. It's actually supposed to, you're supposed to have many more churches than just one, two, three, or four. And so he asked me how many churches I had, and I said, I have three. And he said, uh, three? Wow, I would love to have three. I said, yeah, well, it's, you know, as you know, it's a lot of work. As a pastor, you, you spend a lot of time with a lot of people. And um, I said, how many churches do you have? And he says, 22. And my eyes got big, and I said, well, 22? I'd rather have 22 churches than just three. And his eyes got big, and he looked at me, and he said, well, what do you mean? And I said, man, you, you have no idea. The, the work that's going on in North America, we have come to be, we've come to be settled pastors. We, we're hovering over our churches. And he hadn't heard that term before either. So he asked me what I meant. Well, generally, if you want to sum it up real quick, the hovering pastor, he runs the board meetings. He runs the midweek meetings. He visits those that are sick in his local congregation. He preaches every weekend to those that already know and should know and be teachers themselves. He does evangelism, and he's basically the sole source of evangelism for the church. He makes the phone calls. He sends the letters. He uh, sets the budgets. He, you know, you go on and on, and this is the guy that basically does everything. He's the hands. He's the feet. He's the eyes. He's the mouth. He's the legs. He's the elbows. He's the knees and knuckles, all, all of it, the whole body. And But we're not supposed to be. The minister is supposed to be the one who trains, and he travels around, and he, he preaches, yes, but he's trying to preach to those that are outside of the church, generally, the flock that understands the truth. And he's supposed to be bringing people into the church, those people that understand the truth, and they will be the ones that educate them and do some more training and give them opportunities like scripture reading and leading out in songs and, you know, visiting them and giving them opportunity to distribute literature. But the minister is supposed to be going out and establishing new churches, ordaining elders and deacons and various things like that. And that's how the church is supposed to grow. And he recognized that he was more an unsettled pastor. He was not hovering over his church compared to me. And so as I was describing the ministry I had in North America, he was explaining to me what was going on in his ministry. And my mind was just really working this through. I was saying how amazing it is that he, well, that God had given me the opportunity to go to Tanzania to be able to look around and see this actual work being done compared to what I was doing in North America. So in some places in the world, the Seventh-day Adventist pastors, by default, uh, out of necessity, they are not hovering. And so the reason being is they've been given so many churches, they can't hover. They can't be at one church the whole time, or else everybody else will be crying out after them, saying, what's wrong with you, pastor? And so um, <laughs> I was setting up the system in my local congregations. I had three of them there in, in Michigan at the time, in 2007. I was in Ludington, Shelby, and... Um, Oh, I don't remember the last one, the, the name of the last one. I'd already had, had that one for a short time before I actually took this other call. But um, I may remember it in a minute. But Ludington and Shelby, I was at these churches with another one. And I was doing all that I could to train the elders, the concepts of not hovering, of what the minister should be doing. And I got a lot of negative feedback. And, and here's why. 
in North America anyways, the elders, because there are so few men who are dedicated to the truth anyways, the elders have been chosen of the cream of the crop, if you will, the, the very top, most spiritual, capable, the ones that have the most gifts, etc. Those are the guys that have been called to be elders. Many of them shouldn't even be elders. I've had seven different churches, and I've worked with many different churches, lots of them. I've, I've worked with, I don't know how many churches, but um, I've worked closely with a lot of churches, but I've actually been the senior pastor of seven. And so what we have is the reality in a lot of churches that many of the elders, they're there because there's nobody else to choose. It's not because these are spiritual leaders that are really studying the Bible and they're proclaiming the truth and doing everything they can to build up the kingdom of God. We don't have those kind of elders very often in North America, okay? We have guys that are gifted. Sure, they can speak. Sure, they can run a meeting. Sure, they can visit somebody. But they're busy. They've got work. They've got families. They've got projects. They, they go on vacation a lot. You know, these are the guys that are, you know, generally the elders. Anyways, so we have these, uh, I, I was trying to educate the, the elders there in Ludington, Shelby, and this other church. I'm, I'm going to remember that name in a minute. But uh, we, I was getting a lot of negative feedback saying, Pastor, you, uh, you're the one that's doing this work. I'm not doing this work, right? You're, you're the one that's supposed to be, I'm, I'm going to try to change the focus here because I can't see you all. I can only see somebody, um, somebody else's black screen. Anyways, I don't know if I can do that, uh, if I can change it. But what we have is the, uh, the three elders, I'm sorry, the three churches having elders, they were so busy, the elders, with their own jobs, with their own families, with their own projects at home and trying to upkeep their properties that they had purchased and, you know, uh, working on the, the one of some of the elders were actually building the local church down at the one I can't remember and <clears throat> the name of the one I can't remember. And so uh, all the elders were busy and they just told me, one of them told me, said, you're trying to teach us stuff that is back in the 1800s, Pastor we can't do this. You need to move your thinking up to the 2000s, you know, up to the 19, uh, it was the 2000s, early 2000s. And I remember just thinking, wow, this is, this is very difficult to believe and understand. This is very difficult to wrap my head around. Like, God, I'm not going to be able to do this. I know from my own study, I know, I know that what I'm doing is wrong, but I, I'm not able to make a change in my activities. I don't have the ability to um, do differently than what I'm doing. I don't have the support of the local church, which you need to have. You have to have elders that are saying, okay, pastor, we've got the local congregation. We're going to work everybody. If, if somebody needs a visit, we're going to take care of it. We're going to organize so that if we can't do it as elders, we're going to send some deacons. If the deacons can't do it, we're going to have the deaconesses work together and However the church is structured, you should be able to have elders that will work with what's going on there and say, Pastor, you go out and you do services. We're going to, you know, pray for you. We're going to financially support your evangelism outreaches. And we're going to, you know, you can be a, a literature evangelist. You can be a Bible worker. You can be a preacher, an evangelist. You can do all those things. We've got this. Well, I didn't have that. So as I said um, the other day while I was with you all, the conference president was visiting all the local pastors in his um, conference. And so when he came to my house, I, had, I was looking forward for him to be there because I wanted to explain to him, listen, I've got this real burden on my heart that I'm hovering and I shouldn't be. Well, he wanted me to stay there in the local area so that I would be able to implement the non-hovering pastoral ministry and the other pastors would be able to see like, hey, wait a minute, I want to do that too. We should be planting churches and establishing or ordaining elders and, and those kind of things. And uh, so he told, he challenged me. He said, I, I want you to pray. Because I told him, I said, I'm really interested in going and serving to do media ministry because I had been reading this book, like I told you, the uh, Cole Porter Ministry. I really want to do digital ministry. And so he said, I, I, I want you to pray. I know you want to leave, but please, I want you to stay here and implement this. Pray for a week. And then at the end of the week, let me know what you think. And so I prayed hard. I prayed really hard that week. Lord, please have mercy on me. I want to be able to understand what you want me to do in this scenario where, that I'm in. 
And so I prayed really hard. Like I said the other day, I prayed probably harder that week than I did during the, the, the weeks that I was preparing for getting married. And so <clears throat> as I came to the end of that week, I knew for sure God was telling me, if you continue in this ministry, you're going to try to do what I'm asking you to do because you believe it. I know you believe it, but you're going to become discouraged. And so I recognized that I was not fitting into the North American division pastoral ministry setup. Now, why? What's the big deal? Well, I'll tell you why, because we have been counseled in the writings of the pioneers. You can go and search this for yourself. I don't have those, those writings with me in this presentation, but they were saying that if we don't continue spreading the gospel and as ministers, we become like other priests and, and cardinals of other faiths, like specifically the Catholic faith, we're going to take up their model of pastoral ministry or priestly ministry. We don't want settled pastors. We want pastors that are going out and moving forward the gospel as fast and as far as they can. And so we want to reach in different areas, different locations, go to different countries. We want to be able to expand around our homes, etc. And so uh, that's why this is a big deal to me, because it was I was actually honoring the model of not the Seventh-day Adventist model. I was honoring the model of Catholicism or regular apostate Protestantism where you have one pastor and the congregation's happy and they have two or three meetings every Sunday and everybody's happy. But no, that's not what I wanted. I wanted to be able to have a local church that was busy as a beehive. And I'm out there trying to do things outside beyond that. And that's what I was hoping for, but it, it didn't work out. So at the end of that week, I finally just called the president and I said, brother, listen, I cannot continue. And uh, I've, I've made up my mind. I'm going to be going. And I gave him the date of when I was leaving. And so from that point forward in 2007, I separated myself from um, the local Seventh-day Adventist pastoral ministry. <clears throat> that, and I continued in uh, various different types of ministry for the next, uh, what, eight years. I was a, what is that? No, nine years. I was a, a, an ordained minister until 2016 and working with different conferences and doing various things, which ended up being digital ministry. Um, I was a teacher at a local school and the, the pastor as well over the school. I was doing part-time preaching on the weekend as a quote-unquote pastor and uh, various ways and in different scenarios. So now that I've told you all my story about what led me into um, studying the hovering concept and also what led me out of the North American pastoral ministry, I'm going to go with you to some of the notes that I compiled a while back. And like I said, this is not the complete study. There's so much more to go into it. But what I did here is I looked at some of the first studies I put together, and it's called Hovering, and a few extras in the E.G. White writing. And this time I put some Bible verses along with the concepts that are there in Ellen White's writings. The reason why is because when I use the writings of Sister White these days, I want to be sure that I am showing <clears throat> that Sister White said some amazing things. And as far as I can tell, everything she has said, well, okay, there are variants uh, with like numbers and various things like that. But the concepts of what she has said, all of it is consistent with the Bible. Now, she doesn't uh, vary away from truth. She's an amazing author. God has called her to be the messenger for these last days. Though, I want to show that everything she says, the principles can be found in the Bible. So we're going to do that today. And as I'm looking here, it says in the uh, book Evangelism, and by the way, that is a very good book. There is a section from page 613 to 617, which is very confusing, and it shouldn't be uh, understood as truth. You should go into the context of that one and really understand the concepts of who God is and who he is not. But the book itself is a pretty good one. And so looking at Evangelism 381.2, it says, As I traveled through the South on my way to the conference, I saw, God, I saw city after city that was unworked. What is the matter? Well, the ministers are hovering over churches which know the truth while thousands are perishing out of Christ. And the Bible concept that I brought together with this one is here. In Matthew 24, verse 14, it says, And this gospel of the kingdom 
shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. And that's really important to understand there is that we have this idea of why are not the cities being reached? And the answer was, according to Sister White, because the ministers are hovering. And we don't want hovering ministers. That's the whole point of this section. We want ministers that are willing and able to go out and do as much as they can as quickly as possible so that they will be able to win souls that are in darkness, you see. And so then what I was saying earlier is, is kind of followed up in this next section where it says, continuing on in, in the book of evangelism, if the proper instruction were given, if the proper methods were followed, every church member would do his work as a member of the body. He would do Christian missionary work, but the churches are dying as they want a minister to preach to them. Okay, this is, this is amazing. So people around the churches are dying because the minister is hovering. Okay, that's the concept. And the churches are dying as well because they want ministers to preach to them. Wait, whoa, whoa, whoa what, what, what's going on? Well, it's kind of like the concept that I heard years back from uh, Doug Batchelor. It was really a good one. You have the Sea of Galilee that's fruitful. It's, it's got beautiful green, uh, ver uh, how do you call that, like foliage around it. You've got green trees and grass and beautiful flowers on the hills. And it, it's a nice, beautiful place. But just not far away from it, you've got the Dead Sea, which doesn't have any greenery at all. No grass, no trees, nothing. And you're wondering, well, why not? It's the same stream that, that feeds both of them. Well, one thing is, is that there's water that comes into the Sea of Galilee, and that water goes through the Sea of Galilee and out of the Sea of Galilee. And as a result of water coming in and out, you have this beautiful flourishing area. Well, the Dead Sea, it doesn't have the out. There's only water that comes in. And as a result, there, it's full of salt. And nothing grows where there's too much salt. So you have this concept, this, this spiritual concept there in the Middle East where if you have the living water coming in and going out, you will be blessed with fruit and you will have greenery and the, the beauty of the flowers in your life and all that wonderful stuff that comes with fresh water. But if only you have water that comes in, then you're going to become diseased and salty. And it's like, you, you won't be good for anybody. And that's what's happening here in this concept. We have the minister, he's preaching and pouring water into this church, and but water's not going out. He should be going out and doing ministry, sending the water of life all over. And as a result of him bringing people in, then they would be able to do evangelism right there in their local area and they would be pouring water from themselves into the new converts, you see. And so it would be a living experience rather than just the minister pouring water into the Dead Sea. And that's what's happening. And so what we have is in the next section of this study, I'm going to go through 1 Corinthians chapter 12, and we're going to read a few verses where it says in verse 12, as the body is one, and has many members, it's supposed to have many members, and all the members of that body are one body, being many, well, they are one body, and so also is Christ. He is the head, we are the body. For by one spirit we are all baptized into one body, whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free, whether we be pastors or members, and we have been all made to drink into one spirit. For the body is not one member, but many members. In other words, the pastor doesn't do everything, but there's supposed to be a lot of activity going on. Verse 15. If the foot shall say, well, because I'm not the hand, I'm not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? Of course not. Verse 16. If the ear shall say, because I'm not of the eye, or I'm not the eye, am I not of the body? Is it therefore not of the body? The answer is no. If the whole body were an eye, where were the hearing? In other words, if everything was an eye, could it hear? No. If the whole body was hearing, how could it smell? But now hath God set the members, every one of them, in the body as it hath pleased him. Verse 19, and if there are 
if there were one member or they were all one member, where would the body be? Verse 20, but now are they many members, yet but one body. And the eye cannot say unto the hand, I have no need of you, nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. Nay, much worse, those members of the body which seem to be more feeble are necessary. And, or not much worse, much more, sorry, verse 23. And those members of the body, which we think to be less honorable, upon these we bestow more abundant honor, and our uncomely parts have more abundant comeliness. For our comely parts have no need, but God hath tempered the body together, having given more abundant honor to that part which lacked. In other words, it's all working together. Some parts are good, some parts are not so good of your body, but still they all work together, verse 25 that there should be no schism in the body, but that the members should have the same care for one another. Verse 26, and whether one member suffer, all the members suffer with it, or one member be honored, all the members rejoice with it. Now ye are the body of Christ and members in particular, and God hath set some in the church, first apostles, secondarily prophets, thirdly teachers, after that, miracles, then gifts of healing, helps, governments, diversity of tongues. Are all apostles? No. Are all prophets? No. Are all teachers? No. Are all workers of miracles? No. Have all the gifts of healing? No. Do all speak with tongues? No. Do all interpret? No. But covet earnestly the best gifts, and yet show I you a more excellent way. And then he goes into the love chapter of chapter 13. So we can understand the basic concepts there in this section where not everybody is one member. Not everybody's the mouth, or neither is just the pastor the mouth, right? The pastor isn't the hands and the feet and the arms and the legs and the elbows and the neck and everything. No, the pastor is a part of the body. And so what we have done in North America anyways, in too many of our churches in perhaps Kenya, I don't know, but uh, some places in the world, the reason why I don't know about Kenya is because I've changed the message that I used to preach, and now I teach the truth about God, and I'm not invited into the regular uh, conference churches any longer. In fact, many of them are very angry with me, which is fine with me because if they don't like me for truth's sake, they're not arguing against me, they're arguing against God. And I stand firm upon the fact that God is not a trinity, he is God, he is one God, that is the father, and he has a son. And so anyways, we have this, uh, that's why I don't know about the work there in Kenya is because I've never been to the official general conference churches there. I was there in Tanzania, and that's how I know about it. Anyways, um, the pastor doesn't do everything in the church. We're supposed to be working together, and that's the concept that we see in the writings of Sister White. Now, going on to Manuscript 150 in 1901, it goes on to say that uh, they should be taught to bring a faithful tithe to God, that's the people, that he may strengthen and bless them. Okay, the tithe is not about the work necessarily, it's about them, them being blessed by God, because God has asked them to do something monetarily and God will bless them. They should be brought into working order that the breath of God may come to them. They should be taught that unless they can stand alone, without a minister. They need to be converted anew and baptized anew. They need to be born again. And here's the biblical concept that goes with that. Whether of them twain did the will of his father? They said unto him, well, the first. Jesus said unto them, verily I say unto you that the publicans and the harlots go into the kingdom of God before you. For John came unto you in the way of righteousness, and you believed him not. But the publicans and the harlots believed him. And ye, when ye had seen it, repented not afterwards that you might believe him. And so people that are in the church, they really like the idea that they have a minister and that it's there, you know, it, that's his pastor. We're paying our tithe. And as a result of paying our tithe, we're paying his salary, and he needs to be at my beck and call. So if I'm sick, my pastor is going to be there. 
And if I'm sick, I don't want one of the elders. In fact, I know that's true. That has been said a number of times. If I'm sick, I don't want the past, the, one of the elders to come visit. I want the pastor to be there, you know, because that's how people think in North America here is because they pay the pastor's salary. The, you know, it's not that the tithe in the Seventh-day Adventist church goes directly to the pastor. That's not how it works. The tithe goes to the conference, and the conference takes a tenth of that, keeps it there, sends the rest of the union. They take a tenth, which sends it to the rest, to the rest of the GC or the division, and then to the GC. And that's how it works locally. And the, the local um, offerings stay there at the local church, but the pastor doesn't get those either. So the pastor gets his pay, and he's supposed to do service with, uh, through that pay. And that pay is from the tithe, and that's why the members say that, <clears throat> well, we pay the pastor's salary, he needs to be here. And so the whole idea of the uh, members that think they need a pastor to be at their beck and call, it says if they can't stand alone, they need to be converted and baptized again. That's profound. So when I read that, I was like, whoa, this is, this is a big deal, right? This is not something that we need to just... Uh, misunderstand this is something we need to understand and this is what i was wrestling with as a pastor there in north america or here in north america and so the publicans and the harlots those that accept the truth and, and love the the gospel they will come in before those that are in the church and it's it's amazing how the principles of the bible are uh, found in stories that sister white writes so we're going to go on now to the next one in testimonies volume six found in evangelism and it says, <clears throat> instead of keeping the ministers at work for the churches that already know the truth, so ministers should not be working at churches that already know the truth. Let the members of the churches say to these laborers, go work for souls that are perishing in darkness. We ourselves will carry forward the services of the church. We will keep up the meetings and by abiding in Christ will maintain spiritual life. We will work for souls that are uh, right here about us, and we will send our prayers and our gifts to sustain the laborers in more needy and destitute fields. And that just, that's just what happened in the book of Acts. But you can see what's interesting in this next set, set of verses. If you look up the word church and house, this is what you'll find. As for Saul, he made havoc of the church, entering into every house. Now, wait a minute. When he made havoc of the church, he was entering into houses, and he hailed men and women, committing them to prison. Now, why did he enter into houses? Well, not only because members lived in houses, but also members had churches in their houses, like fellowships. It says there in verse 5 of Romans 16. Likewise, greet the church that is in their house. Now, going down to 1 Corinthians 11.22, what? Have we not houses to eat and drink in? Or despise ye the church of God and shame them that have not? What shall I say to you? Shall I praise you in this? I praise you not. In other words, they were doing communion in their houses, but they were eating and drinking in a way that was disrespectful. And so Paul was saying, hey, we've got houses for that, but now let's treat our houses differently and, and do the communion in a way that's glorifying God. First Corinthians 16, 19, the churches of Asia salute you. Aquila and Priscilla salute you much in the Lord, with the church that is in their house. And then the next one, Colossians 4.15, salute the brethren which are in Laodicea and Nymphos, and the church which is in his house. Verse Timothy 3.5, for if a man know not how to rule his own house, how shall he take care of the church of God? Now that doesn't mean necessarily that this is saying the church is in his house, but you've already seen that there are churches or gatherings in houses. First Timothy 3.15, if I tarry long, that thou mayest know how thou oughtest to behave thyself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth. And so here it's talking about the house of God. And so many times the church is in our houses. The house of Daniel may be the house of God because it is his church. And that's the concept there. So Philemon 2, to our beloved Aphia and Acrippus, or our keep us rather, our fellow soldier, and the church in thy house. And so what we've seen here is that the churches in the houses are much more like what we've seen today in this time since 
for me anyways, since 2015, when I started doing ministry in, um, well, ministry in the truth about God, I recognized that we immediately got resistance from the churches that are teaching the Trinity and which, you know, in, the, in this case, in our, in our concept now, in, in our context, the Seventh-day Adventist corporate churches, and they didn't want me to be there. They, in fact, I was very quickly, all the churches in this entire conference were told, if Daniel Mesa is invited to your church, please do not allow him to speak. And so whatever. I recognized that the churches in the homes that I was able to go to, I've been able to do a lot of traveling. And most of the places I've gone to have been either in rented halls or in homes or in many cases, barns or garages or, you know, extra extended places where it's not really a living space. But I've been in a lot of different places. And those are the churches that are being established around the world right now with the one, in the One True God movement. And the reason why is because the local buildings that we, we used to gather into, they don't want us there anymore. I mean, do you guys know this? I know Zadok, he's told me his story, and uh, Sammy have told me their story. They know that you can't just go and preach in a regular conference church these days. They don't like it. And if they do know what you're saying, if you haven't yet explained yourself, then uh, they'll, they'll allow you in. But as soon as you explain yourself, then within a short time, you're not allowed behind the pulpit anymore. And so the churches in the house are the ones that we can apply to this where, Pastor, you go and do your services. You go and preach. You go and continue to establish other churches, other home churches in different locations, and we'll take care of this situation here. We'll try to reach our local neighbors, and we'll, we'll encourage them in the Lord. And uh, so when we've got a couple of new people, we'll invite you back, and then you can come and teach them and help us there. And that's what's been a real blessing in this movement. It's been much more in concert with the non-hovering ministry compared to what I used to do in the Seventh-day Adventist Church as a minister. So I'm going to go now to uh, read the next one in evangelism. This is uh, from letter 136 in 1902. It says, as a general rule, the conference laborers should go out from the churches into new fields. So as a general rule, the conference laborers should go out from their churches into new fields, using their God-given ability to a purpose in seeking and saving the lost. This is the idea of not hovering over churches. Matthew 24, 14. This gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. And he said unto them, Go ye into all the world, and preach the gospel to every creature. So following Sister White's writings, go ahead and keep it on that screen. I'll read in just a moment here. But following Sister White's writings gives you much more the ability to fulfill the gospel commission. It says here in letter 56 in 1901, Our ministers, or sorry, letter 169 in 1904, our ministers should plan wisely as faithful stewards. They should feel that it is not their duty to hover over the churches already raised up, but that they should be doing aggressive evangelistic work, preaching the word and doing house to house work in places that have not yet heard the truth. They will find that nothing is so encouraging as doing evangelistic work in new fields, which is true. Because it's that's like the that's like the bread with honey on it. It's, it's amazing. <clears throat> if the ministers would get out of the way, they would go forth into new, if they would go forth into new fields, the members would be obliged to bear responsibilities and their capabilities would increase by use. And that's what we see here in Acts chapter 20, verses 18 through 20. This is Paul talking. When they came to him, he said unto them, <clears throat> <clears throat> you know, from the first day that I came into Asia, after what manner I had been with you at all seasons, serving the Lord with all humility of mind and with many tears and temptations, which befell me by the laying in wait of the Jews, and how I kept nothing back that was profitable unto you, but showed you and have taught you publicly and from house to house. And so Paul, in his ministry, was doing what we as gospel ministers ought to be doing as well. Publicly teaching, <clears throat> going, showing, 
people personally and also going door to door or house to house. And so we can see in the Bible the concepts that Sister White had laid out very clearly. And we can also see that there's a union between these concepts. And you can now, now realize that me as a pastor, I had very strong convictions, as I still do. If I see something in the Bible and I find that it is true and I can't break it, that's what I want to keep. I want to keep it like a bulldog. I want to hold on to it. And I'm not going to let go. And so when I studied this concept of hovering and I realized that I was guilty of doing this, I didn't like it. I thought, God, I don't want to be doing this. I mean, if there's something else out there, let it be. And as a result, I, um, <clears throat> I had to choose. I actually had to choose to go into um, missionary labor. I was given from, <laughs> I was making a lot of money per month as a pastor and I was secure. I had a job that I could keep for as long as I wanted. Um, I, you know, all I had to do was just kind of play the role of a pastor and there'd be no way I would lose my job as long as I didn't uh, commit adultery or do, you know, steal or do something publicly that would cause me to lose my job. If I just kept low and, and continued on as a Christian, I would have had a great experience. I'd still be there as a pastor who knows where and doing what, but I'm not interested in that. I don't care about nice, um, insurance benefits. And, you know, the nice, cozy workers meetings and the various vacations that you can take every year and all that stuff. It's not really what I was interested in. I want truth. And it's still true. I still want truth. And so going from pastoral ministry into a missionary setting where I was only getting a thousand bucks a month. Well, for you, maybe over in, in a different country, that's a big deal. But in North America, a thousand bucks a month is just barely enough to live on. And so I was, you know, trusting the Lord and he was providing and doing all these wonderful things. And it was great. But God was, um, he was faithful. He was very faithful. He has, he has led me ups and downs in my uh, abilities and places and where I've gone. And it's just been incredible. I would not do it again differently. God has been so amazing in how he has led. And so I would encourage anybody who is a minister wrestling with this concept of hovering just go and do what God is calling you to do. Follow truth much more than man, and you'll be blessed of God. Forget being blessed of man. That's not your business. It's not mine. It's not anybody's. We don't need that. We need the blessings of God, and he will do that. And so now I'm going to read another thing, and then I'll tell a story here. But uh, it goes on that in uh, Gospel Workers from 92, 1892, it says, We feel pained beyond measure to see some of our ministers hovering about the churches, apparently putting forth some little effort, but having next to nothing to show for their labors. The field is the world. Let them go out into the unbelieving world and labor to convert souls to the truth. And that's what we need to do. Now, I've got a note here about ministers' meetings at Camp Sobel in Michigan. I was uh, sitting there along with I don't know, let's say 70 or 80 other ministers. We were in a room and we're listening to preaching and teaching and, and, and education about what the next tax season is going to be like and how, um, you know, the, the laws are changing in this area. And this minister has been transferred over to this location. So now he has a new district and there's been somebody hired in the conference and this guy's retiring. And that's just the stuff you go through in all these ministers meetings. Well, I remember Two things uh, I just reminded right now. The president of the conference stood up one time and he says, you know, I feel ashamed. I feel ashamed to even say what I'm about to say. He says, but today in this conference, we could not and we would not hire John the Baptist. And I thought, whoa, I heard him say that. And it really stuck in my head. Like, did he just say that? But it's true. Like, I knew the system. I, I know that you can't be somebody who's too far uh, leading into truth as a minister. You, you can't. It just, you, you'll be released and you'll be transferred to somewhere else or you'll be given another job. You, you can't be that guy who's really pushing the truth like John the Baptist. <clears throat> he said, frankly, we wouldn't even be able to hire Jesus Christ. And I remember just thinking for a moment like, whoa, am I working right now? in a system that wouldn't be able to hire John or Jesus? 
And it stuck with me. That one, I never forgot that. That was, uh, <clears throat> he's retired now, but that was President, um, <laughs> man, I can't even remember his name. I, I'm just not remembering too many things right now. But I know the new president, but I can't remember his name. Anyways, it doesn't matter. <clears throat> Anyways, one of the things he was doing, he, he was giving reports on how many baptisms were in the various districts. And I suppose he would do this in some cases to encourage the ministers, but in some cases he would shame them. And I remember I, I, as many years as I was there in that conference, seven years, I, at least at the beginning, there was a lot of baptisms. I think in the first year there was, you know, I close to 80 or 90, something like that. <clears throat> but then later in years, after the church had been planted and, and we were done with our evangelistic series, because that's how the church started, later in years, there was like 15 or 20 or, or less, you know, there wasn't quite as many. But still, there was a number of baptisms that we were having every year. And uh, I remember there were numbers, like 30 or 40, different ministers in the church or in the conference there that they would have zero or one or two baptisms in a year. And I just remember thinking like, man, I would be embarrassed if I didn't have baptisms. Lord, please help me to continue reaching souls that want to know and understand the truth. And, you know, that, that just, it, it, it blows my mind that Sister White says, we feel pained beyond measure that some of our ministers hovering over the churches are putting forth some little effort. And that's what's happening. You get this job where you're preaching every weekend, and if somebody's sick, you visit them. You, you go and do a worship at the local school, and you know you, you maybe follow up a phone call or two if, if somebody sends in a Bible study request, or there's maybe a, a visitor that comes into the area and the pastor, you know, one of the members wants the pastor to be introduced to that member. Then you go to their home, but you know, it's, there's not aggressive evangelism. And so it does pain me as well that God has, has to work with a system like he does right now around the world where there's so many hovering pastors, not just in the seven day Adventist church, but all over the place. There's pastors that are just fulfilling the role of preaching and visiting once in a while, and preaching and visiting once in a while, and various things like that. Once in a while, they, they hire somebody to come in to do an evangelistic series, but they don't want to do it themselves, too much work, and, you know, they're, they're busy doing other things like visiting. And so, you know, it's just, it's amazing. I'm going to read just a few more things here, and then we're going to wrap it up. And then if you guys have comments or questions, feel free to uh, write those down, and, and we'll, we'll talk about it. My heart has been filled with sadness as I have looked over the field and seen the barren places. What does this mean? Who are standing as representatives of Jesus Christ? Who feels a burden for the souls who cannot receive the truth till it is brought to them? Ministers are hovering over the churches. Obviously, they're not feeling the burden. As though the angel of mercy was not making effort to save souls. But angels are making efforts to save souls. That's the whole point there, too. God holds these ministers responsible for the souls of those who are in darkness. He does not call for you to go into fields that need no physician. Establish your churches with the understanding that they need not expect the minister to wait upon them and to be continually feeding them. They have the truth. They know what the truth is. They should have root in themselves. These should strike down deeply that they may reach up higher and still higher. They must be rooted and grounded in the faith. In other words, ministers, go on, do something else here in Ezekiel 37. The hand of the Lord was upon me and carried me out in the spirit of the Lord and set me down in the midst of the valley, which is full of bones. He caused me to pass by them round about, and behold, there were very many in the open valley, and lo, they were very dry. And he said unto me, Son of man, can these bones live? And I answered, O oh Lord, God, thou knowest. Again, he said unto me, prophesy unto these bones and say unto them, O oh, ye dry bones, hear ye the word of the Lord. Thus saith the Lord God unto these bones, behold, I will cause breath to enter into you and you shall live. And I will lay sinews upon you 
and will bring up flesh upon you and cover you with skin and put breath in you and you shall live and ye shall know that I am the Lord. So I prophesied as I was commanded. And as I prophesied, there was a noise and behold, a shaking and the bones came together, bone to his bone. And when I beheld, lo, the sinews of the flesh came up unto them or upon them and the skin covered them above and there was no breath in them. Then said he unto me, prophesy unto the wind, son of man, say unto son of man, and say unto the wind, thus saith the Lord God, come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe upon these slain that they may live. So I prophesied as he commanded me, and the breath came into them, and they lived and stood upon their feet, an exceeding great army. Then said he unto me, son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. Behold, they say, our bones are dried and our hope is lost. We are cut off from our parts. Therefore prophesy and say to them, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, O my people, I will open your graves and cause you to come out of your graves and bring you into the land of Israel. And ye shall know that I am the Lord when I have opened your graves, O my people, and brought you out of your graves and shall have put my spirit in you and you shall live and I shall place you in your own land. Then shall you know that I, the Lord, have spoken it and performed it, saith the Lord. So that section of the Bible to me is really inspiring because if we have the word of God given to us and we have been commanded to share the word of God, when we speak the truth, souls that are dead in their sins will live. And we need to be able to teach. We need to be able to share. We need to be able to understand the truth for ourselves so that we can go out and spread the gospel. We don't teach the truth to those that already know it. They're going to just be like the Dead Sea. They need to go out and share the truth that they know so that they can be like the Jordan. And they will be blessed. They will have those dead bones to live. They will be given life. And it's an amazing experience when you teach somebody from the Bible and they take it, they accept it, they understand it, and they go out and start teaching. It is an amazing experience to behold. I have seen it, I don't know how many times. It's a wonderful experience. And God is blessed with my ability to be able to see those things because I know how inspiring it is. And I just have the opportunity to uh, praise him when I see those new people accepting the truth and wanting to share with others. So that's what he's called you to do. I don't know how long you've been in the faith. I don't know, maybe you're a new person. Maybe you've been in the faith for 50 years. You might be somebody who um, you're hearing the truth like, man, I'm, I feel like I'm kind of settled as a Christian. I'm hovering as a Christian. I need to be able to go out and reach out. Well, pray about it. God will open those doors. He, he has people all around you that need to know and understand the truth. And he will use you in a way that will bring others into the truth. And you will see that you can start a fire that will not be put out. By God's grace, may he do that with you and for you. May he do that for all of us. Let's pray, and then if you have any comments or questions, we'll be able to do that now together. But I'm going to bow my head if, you, or if you'd like to. We'll do that. Our Father in heaven, I want to thank you for giving us the opportunity to be able to hear a little bit more about hovering. I know that we didn't get through all the notes, but if the people wanted to uh, read these notes, then... Um, make them available to them. I pray that you please continue to lead us that all of what is given to us in this message, um, may it unsettle us. May it cause us not to hover over the small group that we have, or perhaps the Bible study that we have, or the church that we have, but rather help us to reach out beyond that as well, and to have the world as our focus. Every person that we see, whether we're shopping, or, or walking, or whether we're uh, interacting with a group somewhere, whatever it is in school or at work, help us to see those people as people that we need to reach out and, and teach the truth to. We thank you for this opportunity to be together. We pray that you would continue to inspire us and thank you for this challenge in Jesus name. Amen.